I invite you to open up to the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke this morning. Today is the first day of the Advent season. And a lot of folks aren't real sure about Advent. Some people think maybe only those who are Roman Catholic can celebrate the Advent season. And they confuse it sometimes with with other elements like uh, Lent or something along those lines. But Advent is simply the coming, the arrival. Advent speaks to the arrival of Jesus Christ. And we celebrate the first Advent of Christ with uh, a celebration we know as Christmas and this Christmas season. And I know for many of us today, it may be a little early to begin talking about Christmas, but Today being the first day of Advent, we are going to turn uh, our studies towards Christ. We'll look at His first coming, and we look at the first coming so that we can now look toward the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we remember His first coming because it gives us several things. It gives us hope. It teaches us about the love of God for His people. It also teaches us about joy and about peace And we know that this world needs a heavy dose of all of those things today, amen? But it's really no different from when Jesus came. The world was dark. The world was in great need of saving. In fact, when Christ came at his first advent, the world had been in silence, in a dark silence. In fact, some 400 years we'll speak about here in a few moments. But they had been waiting on a prophet. They had been waiting on a word from the Lord. It had been a long time coming. (laughs) They needed hope. They needed to be reminded of what God's love was all about. And that's what Advent is really all about. And I'll remind you, uh, we have a gift for every family that's here today. And if you're a family of one here today, you count as well. But in the foyer, as you make your way out this morning, if you haven't done so already, there is a, um, a guide, a devotional guide. There are a number of readings in that guide. In fact, there's one that leads us all the way up from December 1st through December 25th, a reading and a, a prayer every day as we look toward the, the day we celebrate Christmas, the day of the arrival of Christ, His first coming. But I would invite you to take one of those, every family, grab one on your way out and and use it in the days ahead. Uh, December is coming. Can you believe it's already nearly the end of the year? This year has flown by. Can anyone relate to that? And I don't know if it's just because I'm getting older, it's going faster. I don't know what it is, but it seems like we're in this time warp that it's just moving way too quickly. We're going to blame it on age. How's that? We'll blame it on age. And so uh, it's happened. I guess I'm officially old now. But today I want us to start with the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. And this may seem a little early, as we said, to begin talking about Luke chapter 2. We should wait at least until December, uh, like the December 18th, maybe the Sunday before, right? But I want us to look because this is really going to tell us about the backstory of Jesus' coming. And we're going to see about hope today. And really, what I hope that we will all see is that the backstory to Jesus' birth, it really does build hope within us. It gives us a sense of of understanding of what it means to hope in God. And we're going to see that He always keeps His promises. And folks, the first coming of Jesus should make it just absolutely cr- clear and concrete in our, in our hearts and our minds that if Jesus came the first way as He promised, His first coming... He will absolutely come again to redeem us, to rescue us from the presence of sin. And I long for that day. How about you? With the psalmist, I pray, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. How about you? Amen? This world has nothing to offer uh, that, that can compare to what Christ Jesus is and what He has for us. And so I pray today that we would put our hope in Jesus Christ the Lord. So let's look at Luke chapter 2. I invite you to follow along verses 1 through 7. We'll really focus in on verses 1 through 5 today, but let's read all seven of those first verses. It says this, Now in those days, in those days, and these were dark days, we'll talk about here in a moment, but in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. It was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. 
Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which was called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Or literally the, the guest room. <laughs> There's no room for them. Now, we see a number of things here. I want to focus only this week on three key things today. And I hope if you have uh, uh, your worship bulletin, there are some notes there. I hope that you will um, take notes as well this morning. I know if you're like me, it helps to see it, to hear it, and to write it down. Some of you, I know, can just listen, and you suck it all in. Mike and I have had this talk through the years. Mike listens intently, and he remembers way more than I remember even writing it down oftentimes. But, but uh, for me, and for some of you as well, I would encourage you to be a note taker, a note taker. Now, let me say one quick other note before we really get into this. Um, if you think I'm winking at you today, I'm not. I know I said this a few weeks ago, but... For the last couple months, I've been having these migraines off and on, and, and I'm not sure if it's the brighter lights or, or what, but this one started yesterday. Uh, we were looking for a new coat, and the lighting in that place, that coat factory, whatever that place is, Burlington, I pray I never have to step foot in that store again. I just, just want to throw that out there. Uh, that was not good tidings for me yesterday, but, but this headache kind of kicked in, and, and standing here again, it's these lights, I think, are really kind of adding to it, but, but uh, just know, Heather, I'm not winking at you, okay? None of you. I'm not winking at anybody. If, if I was winking at anyone today, praise God for that. I don't know what just happened. Well, now, we've been having some technical difficulties this morning. The screens have flickered. The other microphone was not working so well. We've got a little feedback. And I don't know if that was the Lord or Becky back there. How you doing? All right. So uh, I do wink at you, don't I? Okay, that's my wife. That's my wife. So those of you listening, that's my wife I'm talking to. But turn back to Luke. And let's look. Three key things here today. That's, that's really a lot better this hope that we can see in Jesus. Now, as I mentioned earlier, as we got started, number one, this was the worst of times. This was the worst of times. And that's a good way to start a story, right? And I think someone has, has, uh, has used that line before. But this was absolutely the worst of times. I mean, we think that we live in trying times, and I know that we do, not just politically, but economically, psychologically, I mean, we are, we are just kind of been hit by a number of things, it seems like, and they just keep compounding and building, and, and for all of our intelligence and for all of the technolo technological advances, we've done nothing to help our fear and our anxiety and our depressions and, 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 and our estate. I mean, the world is in a sad place, but the first century when Christ came was no different. Now, they didn't have the problems of technology that we have added to our plates today, but they were no less stressed and no less obsessed and no less depressed. Uh, depressed. Yeah, depressed. That's right. I said that right. It just sounded funny. But things were, were just as bad as they were for us and as they are for us today. They needed hope. In fact, as I mentioned, God's silence was so loud in this time when Jesus came. It had been 400 years since a prophet was on the scene. And so since the last word of God had been spoken, it had been 400 years. They were waiting, longing, and anticipation. And you'll remember that the promise seed of God had been, had been promised. I mean, from the very beginning, in Genesis 3, 15, we see that the seed of the woman, the promise of God, the first messianic promise that, that God was going to save mankind through, not the seed of man, as would make sense, but the seed of the woman, that first messianic hint was given there in the garden. That the seed of this woman, in fact, we go on to read in Isaiah, we see it beginning in chapter 7, that the seed of the woman would be, uh, would speak to this virgin birth of the one who would come, the Messiah. Now remember, the word Messiah was that Hebrew term, and we talk about this every year, but it means the anointed one of God. And the Jews were looking for the anointed one of God, but they did not have they did not have the fullness of Scripture at that time, if I could say that. 
They had the Old Testament. You'll remember during that intertestamental period uh, had already been completed. The Old Testament had been translated into the Greek language around 270 A.D. The Septuagint came on the scene. And so they had all of the Old Testament translated into Greek. Every book of the Old Testament had been translated, had been codified, so to speak. So everyone, not just in the, the Jewish region, but, but it had been disseminated because of Alexander the Great, his coming, and he had even codified the Greek languages. And so all of the conquered world was speaking a common Greek, the Koine Greek, that means common. And so I think there were six or seven different dialects of even Greek during that day. But he had made it unified. And so during this time, during that time, around 270 AD, even the Hebrew scriptures and some Aramaic we know, even that had been translated into this common Greek language. And it was as if God had intended all of this to happen at just the right time. Now, on Christmas Day, we're going to talk about just the right time. We're going to be studying from Galatians chapter 4, maybe an unusual Christmas Day passage, but we're going to see that God is never early and God is never late. He always does things perfectly and right on time. And this time when Jesus came was no different. God had been silent. There had been 400 years since the last prophet, but God was still at work. And I was reminded this week, of the first public sermon that I was able to share. It was at McDonald Baptist Church here in Orange, Texas. It was many, many years ago. Uh, it was before my ordination service, and I think that's why it was probably kind of reminded me today. But, um, but this ideal of God's being, God being silent, God's silence, uh, brought me back to that first passage. And that first sermon that I preached was from uh, Genesis. It was about Joseph and all of the troubles that Joseph saw and how he was, I mean, just tormented left and right with problem after problem after problem. Family problem. Uh, he had lady problems, right? He had authority problems. All of these things happened to Joseph, and Joseph remained faithful. And more importantly, God was faithful even though he was silent. He was still moving and working and orchestrating things sovereignly behind the scenes so that Joseph would be right where God needed him to be to save his family and all of the Jewish people. God still works that way today. And folks, just, just know that if God seems distant and silent, that doesn't mean that God is still. It doesn't, or excuse me, it doesn't mean that he is not working. He may seem still, like not moving, but God is always doing what God does. He is perfect. He is always in control. There is nothing that happens that's beyond the reach of God and the sovereign plan and hand of the God Almighty that we serve. Amen? So please remember that. Please remember that. God keeps his promises, even in the worst of time, even when it seems like he is silent. No, as Psalm 33, 11 says, that the counsel of Yahweh stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. God is still moving and working, even though we may not understand or see what he is doing. He breaks through and does what only God can do. And that's what he did with the birth of Jesus. God broke through 400 years of silence with the birth of Jesus. And though the world was in darkness during that time, the world's darkness was there. It was thick. You ever been in a really dark place? You ever been in where there's, I mean, just no, no light, it seems, whatsoever? I remember, I may, may have shared this before, but a few years back, our family just decided not to really um, do gift exchange. Uh, we decided to, to save that money and take a trip, and so we went to Arkansas. We spent a little time in Hot Springs, which was great. Then we went further north to Eureka Springs, and uh, it had been, it had been, oh, 30 years probably since Becky and I had been to Eureka Springs. I think it was on a youth trip the last time we had been up there. But so we went and we stayed in a nice old historic uh, hotel, which means lots of mold <laughs> and sickness, right? And so uh, we stayed there. But while we were there, we did this tour. Now, I'll say it was what they call today a ghost tour. Now, okay. Now, don't believe in ghosts. There's no such thing as ghosts. I like those kind of things because you get a lot of history from them. You don't see ghosts, right? You don't get scared and all of those things. But as we're making our way through this old historic hotel, I forgot the name of this place, but it's the Crescent, I think, the Crescent Hotel. As we're going through, some of y'all have been there. So on this tour, they take you down. One of the last things they take you on is the morgue. There was a morgue at the bottom of this hotel. It's down in the basement. I mean, you're several floors down. And this used to be a, a hospital, I think, was, was kind of the situation. And uh, it was like a, uh, a 
prison hospital or so. I can't remember all the details. All I know is when we got down to that bottom basement floor, we go into the room and they ask you, how many of you would like to be closed off in this room? And of course the girls were, you know, okay, we'll do this. And I forgot which one went in there now. It was so, it was both of you. So did we all go in except for Becky? Did you go? Y'all are sitting here going, why, why don't you remember all these things before you get up to preach? Oh, sorry. I, I, I didn't remember them all. But so Be- Becky stayed out, but the two girls, Madison and Macy and I, go in. And when they closed that door, now I don't normally get scared, but can I just tell you, it was so thick, the darkness. I mean, there was no light. There was no air either, okay? And so it was really stuffy and, and dark, and you're underground. And, of course, you know, they're trying to tell you scary things, but, but that wasn't the issue. The issue for me was just that it was so, unbelievably dark right and so I do what I do oftentimes when I get uncomfortable or scared I try to make a joke or, or reach over and pinch a stranger you know in the dark and so so I'm just trying to do anything to take my mind off how unbelievably dark it was I mean it was thick it was thick but this was more than just a physical darkness there was spiritual darkness and I can't fathom what it would be like to be lost again. I can't imagine now that I know Christ, now that he has reached down and saved me and called me unto himself, I can't fathom what it must be like to be in spiritual darkness. I mean, I have some ideas. I, I remember how I was, but even then, I can't look past the hope that I know today. I can't see and really, really comprehend what it must have been like anymore I really I really can't remember I still see it through the um, the light of Christ it's hard to remember how dark and how hopeless it must have been all I can do is try to imagine and think lovingly about those who do not know Jesus do you have family and friends who are lost and don't know Jesus they're hopeless they may place their hope in their bank accounts, their 401ks, their, the government or education or, 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 or something else. But let's, let's be honest, none of those things last. None of those things carry us into the presence of God in eternity. And none of those things save us for all of eternity. Folks, these were dark days. There was no visible sign of God, no visible promise that he was still going to honor his word for his people. And yet, God does something. The second thing we need to understand here is that through a whole lot of ordinary, God does something extraordinary. I mean, there were ordinary things happening, things that we still today really don't care for. How many of you get those thick uh, letters, uh, those surveys, uh, the census things from the government? I think it's about every 10 years that our government does. You know what I do when those things come in the mail? Just drop them right back into the garbage. <laughs> That's where they belong. I'm not real sure what those things are for, but it's none of anybody's business what I do in my home, right? I don't want more taxes. I mean, come on. Who, who, who wants to fill those things out so they know how many other things they can tax me for? I mean, I, I would have to be foolish. I have done them in the past. But no more, no more. But during this day, it was just ordinary stuff like that. A census was to be taken. And so Joseph and his wife, or his, 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 his young bride, have to travel here some 90 to 100 miles on foot the story of the donkey may or may not be true. That's just another one of those kind of Christmas mythologies like the three wise men, right, who were there at the birth of Jesus. Were they? Do you remember? No, they were not. They came much later to, to the home of Jesus. Um, but that's just another one of those mythologies. But the census was real. They had to travel, and not only just to register for the census, but they had to travel also because of taxation. They had to go and pay their respects to the governing authority. And during this time, the governing authority was Rome. And Rome was not a kind uh, authority figure. Rome was ruthless. And so here you have a couple of young adults Mary being maybe uh, what we would still consider a teenager this day. They're traveling on foot some 90 to 100 miles to a little town called Bethlehem. Bethlehem. We know a lot about Bethlehem. In fact, it would seem that a lot of our um, biblical history actually comes back around to Bethlehem, but nothing more important than this story as it unfolds. We read in Micah chapter 5 verse 2. 
Micah chapter 5 verse 2, pro prophesying again, the prophet Micah speaking to what's going to happen for Israel and for the world. Verse 2 says, but as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth from long ago, from the days of eternity. And so here is a little town. I mean, this is like Orangefield, right? Or Pinehurst. This isn't even the city of Orange, as huge as the city of Orange is. City of Orange is not huge, right? This is Bethlehem, the house of bread, right? The little town of bread. And so there's not a whole lot to this place. And yet, the one who would rule, the one who existed from eternity, he inhabited eternity, is going to come and take on flesh in this place. And so what God does is God orchestrates all of these things to take place. Big things and small things as we'll see. But folks, what I want us to just be reminded as we look now, we're going to see three key things that God's going to do for us through this as he gives us hope. So first of all, know Remember, first of all, that this was bad times. We're in bad times even today. In fact, um, the days are growing darker. I know that many within the realms of Christianity are going to be teaching. They're continuing to teach this idea, I believe a false idea, of this great uh, taking over of the world for Jesus. I think it's misguided. I think they misunderstand biblical prophecy. They've relegated prophecy to a non-essential, and it's affected other aspects of their theological um, beliefs. But, folks, the world is not getting better. I mean, look around. The world is getting worse, darker and darker. And I think it will continue so that the light of Christ will shine that much more greatly through the church in these days, but then through himself as he returns, that second advent of Christ. Amen? And again, I long for that day when Christ does, in fact, come again. But, folks... Yes, God works through ordinary means, but he is still doing extraordinary things through his ordinary people. Folks, there is nothing special about us. And I know that flies in the face of VeggieTale theology, right? You're special, right? I, I, I know that goes against those things. But folks, the reality is we're ordinary. We're just ordinary people, you know? And thank God for that. Ordinary people, right? Some of us are tall, some of us are small, right? Some of us are, are barely, two, barely 100 pounds, some of us are busting many more pounds than that. And yet, we are all just people. But God loves just people. God sent His Son for ordinary people. Think about it. There's no hoop that we had to jump through for God to place His love upon us. God placed his love upon us even though we were yet still sinners, amen? Though there was nothing extraordinary about us, Christ saved us when we could not save ourselves. And again, he does it at just the right time. And so, folks, we can hang our hope on God. We can hang our hope on God. And you may be struggling this morning. I know for a number of the families in our church, these have been some difficult days with sickness. I know a number of people in our church have battled cancer and so far have, have won the battles. Amen? Thank God for that. But you realize if it's not cancer itself, all of us will eventually, if the Lord tarries, our bodies will break down from something. You understand that? Amen? And I know that the world today is fighting. I mean fighting tooth and nail with cloning and, and pharmaceutical advances and all of these different things, trying to do everything possible. Oh, there's this other thing called um, uh, Botox. You remember, you, you, you know, I mean all of these different things in order to, to, to fight off old age and dying. But folks, none of those things can save us. All of the best medicines and, and poisons even, sadly, that so many of you have had to wrestle with and, and put into your body to, to fight off these things. And, and I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer here. Praise God for, I just think about, about Brooks and Charlie and, and Miss Laura fighting and winning. Amen? Amen? And so good. She's always got a smile on her face just talking about Miss Laura. And, and she has done this battle with Mr. Mike. I mean, can you imagine how difficult that's been for her? Just picking on you, buddy. I love you. But folks, this life is hard. But folks, 
remember this body that we're in, this shell, it's going to give way one day to a new body. Can you, can, can you just fathom what it's going to be like? And, and it's hard to imagine. The Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot, but I always think back to how Jesus just appeared in a room right in the in the in the room when the apostles the disciples they were all there gathered and he just kind of appears i'm like thinking you know this is better than star trek right i mean beam me beam me up jesus i mean that's that just cannot fathom what it's going to be like just to be able to to do if we can even do something just remotely close to what jesus was able to do in that glorified state but also think about this the reason i hope in jesus is because even in his glorified body now he still holds the scars. He still bears the scars in that body. The, the, where the nails went through his wrists, through his feet, where the spear was in his side. Remember, even in that glorified estate after appearing in that room, as, as fascinating as that was, what does he tell the doubter, Thomas? He says, stick your hand here. Touch, touch this. Look, see. Stick your hand in my side. That tells us those wounds, those scars from his sacrifice are still there in that glorified body. In fact, again, if you remember in Revelation, remember when, when John is looking for someone to open the scroll, right? In, in some sense, that title deed to all creation. But he's looking for someone and he's weeping. He, there's, he's, he's, he's despondent. He's hopeless in that moment. There's no one worthy in heaven, under heaven, above. I mean, there's just no one there. And then he looks and sees one, a lamb, looking as if it was slain before the foundation, right? Or before the foundation, I'm sorry. This lamb born before the foundation of the world, destined to be crucified. But looking at this lamb slain, looking as one slain. That's Jesus bearing those marks. I hang my hope on God. I, hold my, I hang my hope on Jesus because of who he is and what he's done. Now, three quick things. Number one, God is a God of big things. And this shouldn't surprise us. I mean, think about it. God created everything out of nothing, right? He created everything out of nothing. He called things into existence, and he fashioned it, he formed it, he made the, the, the planets, the stars. He, he creates all of the elements. He creates the atoms, the nucleus of the atom. He creates the things that are even inside of that. What's called the God particle, right, by scientists today. Because there's just no, there's no human intellectual reason why that stuff exists. And so we try to come up with theories. Evolution, and that's just it. It's a theory. It's a theory, and it's a bad one. It's a poor one. It can't be duplicated scientifically. There's no scientific methodology that can reconstruct this theory. It's a bad one. And we do these things to try to undermine the belief of God. But God's the God of big things, calling stuff to exist out of nothing. That's good. I'm reminded of that old joke, and I'm going to butcher it here, but let me just summarize it, all right, so that it's not so bad. God has a, a debate with, with a, an atheist, and they're going to they're gonna create something. The atheist is sure that he can do it, and so some of you have probably heard this. And so the atheist gets ready, and so he takes some dirt from the ground, and God says, uh-uh, that's mine, right? He, he's the one who created all that stuff. The atheist has to create something out of nothing the way God did to begin with. He can't use God's stuff. Folks, we can't write God out of creation. He does big things like that. But more than that, look in Luke 2, verse 1 again. And this isn't as big as creation, some would say, but it's still big. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Augustus was the ruler of Rome during this day, but God is sovereign even over the rulers. He had the man on the throne that needed to be there to orchestrate everything that God wanted to happen. The census the traveling, everything that needed to take place. God is sovereign over kings. God's sovereign over presidents. God's sovereign over elections. But you don't understand, Pastor Kevin, they cheated in that election. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But you know what? I trust God. I trust His sovereignty. Yes, I think those digital voting machines are about as helpful as a slot machine. Okay, I do. I mean, I don't use either one if I can help it. For sure, the slot machine. Those are kind of off the radar. I mean, Josh just the other day tried to get me to, oh no, never mind, never mind. Sorry, that's just a joke. I trust God. I trust God. He's the God of the big things. 
He's, he's over elections. He's over all of these things. He's over our sickness and our health. Nothing escapes him. Proverbs 21.1 says that the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of Yahweh. He turns it wherever he wishes. There's no election that's going to undermine and thwart what God's ultimately going to do. He is sovereign over all or he's not at all. Folks, remember that. Maybe a little cliche, but it's true. It's true. Jeremiah 32, 17. I love this verse. I love this passage. I, I love the book of Jeremiah. I know uh, so PJ, I think, preached through, kind of just did an overview not too terribly long ago. But chapter 32, verse 17 says, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. I don't know if you're like me in some ways, and, and I don't like this about myself, but I see this more and more often, and I'm glad, actually, that I see this more often because it gives me a chance to repent of this. I oftentimes try to do too many things myself. <laughs> Anybody else like that? It's easier just to do it yourself than to enlist other people to do these things because, you know, you've got to go through three or four people because we're all busy, I get that, but sometimes it's just easier to do things myself. But that bleeds into other areas in life as well, not just asking someone to, you know, to fill the baptistry or something simple like that, but... But oftentimes when there are problems, oftentimes my first, and, I, and sadly this is true, I, I, and again, I've repented of this, but sometimes when there's problems, there's issues, maybe it's a problem with someone in the church or, or, or just something, I mean, you know, in, in my own life, I'll, oftentimes historically, my go-to was me. I can fix this myself. You ever done that? You ever been guilty of such nonsense? Our go-to should be God, Amen. When there's a problem, we should go to God. And I'm grateful for problems. And I know I've shared, like, with my story, with my health in the past. I, I'm, I'm grateful, and I'm reminded again and again to be thankful for sickness because sickness turns my heart to God. I'm grateful for that, even for squinting at lights and sounds and, and different things. I, it reminds me that I'm not in this body. I'm not going to live forever in this body. There's more than just this body. It reminds me that I'm, um, I'm brittle. <laughs> I'm brittle. I just thought of peanut brittle when I said that. Oh, man. But I am. I'm frail. This body is frail. Frail. We need God, amen? But He's the God of the big things. He can handle all of our problems. That gives me hope. Secondly, God is the God of small things. Look again at verses 1 and 2. So this decree goes out from Caesar Augustus. That's pretty big. But there's going to be a census. Again, a census. For us, eh, trash, right? They had to do it. But it's still really not that monumental of a thing. It was kind of ordinary already in this day. So that's a small thing, really. But it's going to be taken of all the inhabited earth there, the Roman Empire, Right at this time, that's what's in view. This was the first censor taken while Chi, uh, Chirinius was the governor of Syria. So we're getting another historical name to kind of add here. But, but these, are, these are really not big things. We're going to be taxed. Now I know lately it seems like taxes are a really big thing. They keep growing and growing and growing. But it's really not that big of a deal. But then think about this. A birth. The birth of a child. Many of you have had kids recently. I love the sound of our children. I love to see them. I love the hugs that they give. I love the, the smiles. I love even the kind of the frowns when you try to hug them and they won't hug you. I mean, all of that. Kind of, I mean, I love it. I love all of these things. But, you know, folks' births, as miraculous as they are, they're still pretty common. I mean, think about how many births take place every minute of every day around the world. Kids are being born. You know, you know, I could have quizzed Natalie maybe before this morning, so I won't put you on the spot, but she could probably tell us how many births there are, right, every minute of every day around the world. So you ready? No, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. But it's a pretty ordinary-seeming thing. But here, think about this. It could have been just another birth, but this wasn't just another birth. This small thing was, was talked about. It was whispered about. Because remember, they had not yet been married. So Mary was probably gossiped about. There were probably stories going around. It had probably extended from their small town and had probably made its way uh, from town to town. You know how, how it is, right? When we say things, um, seedy things, salty things. We know how those things travel. Amen? 
And so here is this ordinary birth, this small birth, but it's all perfectly timed by God. All perfectly timed by God. Romans 8, 28 tells us we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. He doesn't miss big things or small things. You get fired from a job that seems like a small thing and then you get a better job and it seems like nothing at all. Something happens at home. Something breaks like for us this past week. (laughs) And actually this was kind of a big thing but in the grand scheme of things it's really not. This, this thing that happened was Becky's automobile begins making a noise. We notice, in fact, Jim Bob, thank you, JB, noticed that the tires were wearing kind of oddly and unevenly, maybe just in alignment, but $2,000 later, the whole front end was replaced. That's a small thing for the grand scheme of life in automobiles, but God handles this. We had it. We were able to take care of this issue. But folks, God is the God of all of these things. And He uses all of these things. He works them all out to make us more like Jesus. And so when we begin to fret, when we begin to worry, we have to remember to put our faith in God. Amen? Which brings us to this last thing I really want you to think about today. It really all builds to this. God is faithful in all things. He's over big things. He's over small things. But folks, he is absolutely faithful in all things. And sometimes when bad things happen to us, I was thinking about, in fact, I just saw this reminder the other day, the late R.C. Sproul. He was so witty, so funny, uh, such a, an intellectual uh, just powerhouse. Uh, to have a smidgen of that intellect would be, would be a great thing. But, but he was so funny as well. Someone asked him about why God allows good things to happen to, or excuse me, why, why God allows bad things to happen to good people. That's what it was. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? And his response, so eloquent, so funny, right, but mm, so right to the heart was that there's only been, you know, the last time God allowed um, bad things to happen to a good person was basically with Jesus. There's only been one good person was kind of how he ended that thought. And he said it in a much more eloquent way than that. But folks, God is faithful in all things. And things we may look at today as being something that is hard and something that's undeserved, right? Something that may be bad. God uses those things. And in the grand scheme of things, He uses them faithfully, (laughs) faithfully for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. While it may be hard, while it may be tragic, God may use those things to make us more like Jesus. He may use... Our, our health or our illness to make us more patient, to make us more reliant upon Him. He may use our poverty this month, right? You ever come to the end of the month? You're coming up to the end of the month and you've got more month left still than you have bank account. Anybody been there? Right? But God is still faithful. I've told you about times in the past how God has shown Himself to be faithful. I told you about that time when I wrongly was, was withholding taxes from a church in those early years of, of ministry. I, taxes, what did I say taxes? I mean our, our giving, right, our giving. Uh, I was withholding our giving. That was not a taxation, I promise you. But then I opened up my drawer after repenting and there's more money than I had even given to, to God. He is so faithful. He's faithful in all things. Look at verses 6 and verse 7. Look at Luke chapter 2 again. He says, while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And so here was the young virgin bride of Joseph. Remember, he wanted to put her away. He thought she had been unfaithful. But God showed him the truth. He he comes to him uh, through an angel and tells him to hold on. He would understand maybe one day. I'm just kind of paraphrasing here. And so Joseph steps out on faith and takes her. They travel, right? They're, they're, they, 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 come, they, they come as, as man. And, and, and honestly, I mean, thinking about this out loud now, we would have to say they're still um, in the engagement period. They had not come together to consummate this union yet. She has Christ before they had consummated their union. So think about that for a second. And so the time comes for her to give birth to her firstborn. And she wraps him in cloths. 
And so here this young bride to be <laughs> at this point, betrothed. Now legally he would still have to divorce her, remember? But they come here now to this place and she gives birth. She gives birth. They lay him in this manger. There's no room for them in the inn. Look at verse 8. In the same region, something else very ordinary, are some shepherds. <laughs> some shepherds. Now, they had not played the lottery. They had not won special access to this event. They had no idea what's going on here in Bethlehem. But they're staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flocks by night. This is what shepherds did. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. I love that. They were terribly afraid, sorely frightened, terribly afraid. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, and behold, I bring good news of great joy, with which, or, or which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. See, God is faithful. In Genesis when Adam and Eve fell into sin, when sin comes into all of the human race because by one man sin entered the human race, Adam. That's what the book of Romans tells us. Not through Eve, but through Adam. Even in that darkness when it looks hopeful, Satan thinks he's won. And then as you make your way through the story of redemption, as God begins to unfold detail after detail after detail of how he would bring about the saving, not just of Israel, but of all those who would be called and all those who would repent and follow Jesus Christ. As God weaves together that scarlet thread of redemption from Genesis chapter 3 all the way through to this very day, to this very day. As He is calling those, He is faithful in all things. Calling those to believe in Him. He does this through Jesus I was reminded also a couple of weeks back getting ready for this Advent season of a passage that I've never preached from. Colossians, or sorry, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20 says this, For as many as are the promises of God, in Him they are yes. In Him they are yes. Therefore also through Him is our amen to the glory of God through us. It literally is telling us that the promises of God, as many as they are, they are amen. They are yes. They are let it be. They are so be it. They are as good as done. God is faithful, amen? God is faithful in all things. His promises are true. And folks, you and I can find hope today, even though maybe our health's not so great. Even though maybe our job is not as secure as it used to be. Our schedule's changed. We have to work shift work now, and, and we haven't had to do that before, but all of a sudden it's changed. Even though bad things may have happened, bad news may have come, God is still faithful in all things. And my prayer is that through this Advent season, in the days that come, that you and I would turn our hearts to Jesus that we would turn our hearts to Jesus and that when, when some news comes that would make us act quickly, that we would stop and we would place our hope and our trust in God, be it good news or bad news. When something comes that, that shakes our faith, that we will remember that God has always been faithful before and there's nothing that can happen that can make Him be unfaithful in the days ahead. That if, if those who came before us could hope, and if through 400 years of no uh, prophet, 400 years of silence, if Israelites could still hold on. I mean, there was a remnant that was still holding on. If people could hold on through that long of a period of silence, then I can hold on this week. I can hold on till, till tomorrow and the day after. I can place my hope in God. He may bring illness. He may bring poverty, but there is nothing that will take place that will cause him to withhold his love and his mercy from his own. Amen? And though we may feel small and insignificant and hopeless, and though we may feel unloved and unworthy, God is always faithful. And if he has called you to be his, he will not let you go. We looked a few weeks back, you remember, at the faithfulness of God and why we can be thankful for the assurance we have in Christ for our salvation. 
Folks, listen. If God is faithful to secure you in your salvation, and he is, right? John chapter 6, John chapter 10, and a plethora of other passages throughout Scripture, Ephesians chapter 1, and others. If God is faithful to hold you securely saved, he is faithful to not put on you more than you can bear. Not to put on you more than he can bear, ultimately, and there's nothing that he can't bear. Not to let you go through things that he will not use to make you and I more like Jesus. To make us more like Jesus. And I know, and let me just confess here, some days I'm with you. Some days it seems like he's working overtime and making me more like him. You ever have that feeling? That Lord, I, you, are, you, you need to take a break. Take five because I'm not sure how much more I can handle today. You ever felt that way? But folks, he's faithful. And I, I'll just tell you, since we're confessing, I've never got to the end of one of those moments when I thought, okay, God, you overdid it. I always come to the end and it's like, God, thank you. I did not realize that I needed this. I did not realize how far I had drifted from that. I did not realize that I needed you so much today. Thank you for this thing. Thank you for this reminder of how awesome and faithful you are. Folks, he is. And the story of the birth of Christ is is, is so many things. And we're going to see more next week when Brother Odek Valbuena is with us, uh, our missionary from the Philippines. As he comes, he's going to share about how, how the, the, the coming of Jesus, God with us, brings us love. It shows us love. And he, he's actually got the easy sermon, Brother Odek. You've got the, the great one, the easy one to uh, share next week. But we're going to be reminded of the love of God and how the birth of Christ demonstrates that. And then the week that follows, we're going to see what that means for us, how we can have joy joy because of what Christ has done. We could use more joy. Amen? We can use that joy. We can be reminded and we're going to see that through Jesus and, and the birth of Jesus, how God with us means eternal peace. And I know from day to day we look and we try to, uh, maybe we don't try to put our faith in things here. Maybe we just get distracted by things here. But folks, even through the things that are happening here, we can have a peace that surpasses all understanding because of Christ. And so the Advent season is a good reminder of God's faithfulness in all of those things. And so I'm going to ask you, if you would, to bow your head with me for a moment. And let's, let's pray together. And let's pray that God would use this season to remind us, and maybe not even gently. <laughs> Almost said, God, remind us gently. But, but maybe God needs to remind us brutally in the days ahead. I mean, maybe He really needs to get our attention. Maybe that's true for you. I know at times it's true for me. But folks, God will faithfully orchestrate whatever surgery he needs to on us to bring us into conformity with his word and with his son. So Christian people, let me ask you this. Have the promises of God found their yes and amen in you? Would you be reminded that through centuries God worked and it seemed like he was late but he was perfectly on time with the coming of Jesus maybe you needed to be reminded this morning of God's faithfulness would you put your hope once again in God would you let those promises that he has fulfilled so far resoundingly confirm that he will be faithful in the days ahead and Christian, let me ask you this. The same question I've asked myself the last week. Does my life reflect that I have hope in God? Does your life reflect the notion that you have placed your all in Christ Jesus? And if that is not true today, would you repent of that? Would you repent of the pride of thinking you can do it yourself? Would you confess that before the Almighty today. And maybe you're here today or maybe you're listening or watching today via the live stream and you are coming under the convicting power of God's Holy Spirit and you realize today that you are not a Christian. I pray that you would repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation today. Would you cry out to God, Oh, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. 
placing your faith, your all, your trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Romans 10 <laughs> tells us, if we confess with our tongue Jesus is Lord, believing in, in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, we will be saved. So God, thank you that you are still faithfully saving. As we demonstrated today through Naomi's testimony, you are still saving people even today by grace through faith through your son Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your attentiveness today. <clears throat> and thank you for your attendance here today. I want you to look around though, church member, and recognize who's not with us today. We still have a lot of people. Some are working today. Uh, some are out of town working. Some are ill. We have a number of people who have come down with the flu. There are a few folks in our congregation who have COVID, um, pretty mild 